Good morning, everyone. I am not a big fan of TV, but there, is, um, there was um, a series in the U.S. that I really liked. It's called The Wire. I don't know if there are any of you that saw it, The Wire. And one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite quotes from one of the character, characters was, "Ain't nothing good last forever." I think it's appropriate to invoke that here. We are on the final day of the General Assembly. We hope that it has gone well so far. There are a few changes to today's program. And it concerns our business in the afternoon. So the keynote speech by Yvonne Owar will take place. After that, we'll have the sessions celebrating Professor Mahmoud Mamdani. And then we'll go for lunch. When we come back, there'll be the report of the Executive Committee to the General Assembly. That will last from 2 o'clock to 3.30. After that, we'll have a break or 30 minutes. And then we'll have the regional meetings. Those will last from 4 o'clock to 5.30. And whenever we finish with all of those regional meetings, we'll reconvoke, we'll um, get together here again for the closing session. So hopefully, latest by 5.30, we'll be done with the regional meetings, and then we'll come back um, to the plenary session. Yeah. But we'll, we'll keep reminding you as the pro program unfolds. I also wanted to make an announcement concerning travel. We hope you've enjoyed Dakar very, very much. But we really hope that um, you will try very hard to be on time for your flights. It's, very important because almost everyone in the Kodesia Secretariat will be off work either from tonight or from tomorrow morning. So that means that if you get stranded here, there will be no one to help you. There are many of us who will throw away our SIM cards or block our WhatsApp or, yes, and people are traveling just like you. Huh? So please try to make your flight. I think um, there are these papers that they are going to um, distribute to you at a hotel so you'll be able to consult. But if you have a pen and a paper, please take note. Friday night, that's tonight, there are people traveling on TAP, Portugal, and Air Algerie. Your departure time from the hotels are 9 p.m. For people traveling on TAP and Air Algerie tonight, there are 17 of you. 9 p.m. tonight, please try to get on the bus. The night of Friday to Saturday, there are people, nine people traveling on Royal Air Maroc. Your departure time from the hotel is at 2 a.m. 2 a.m. for Royal Air Maroc. There are 30 people traveling on South African Airways and Turkish Airlines. South African Airways, Turkish Airlines. Your departure time from the hotel is 3 a.m. 3 a.m. There are 22 participants traveling on Ethiopian. And there is one person traveling on Air Côte d'Ivoire. Your departure time is 4 a.m. Ethiopian Air Code Divide, your departure time is 4 a.m. For people traveling on Saturday, Air Burkina and Air Senegal, your departure time is 8 a.m. Air Burkina, Air Senegal, 8 a.m., Saturday morning. There are 37 participants traveling on Air Code d'Ivoire, Saturday morning. Your departure time from the hotel is 10 a.m. 10 a.m. There are 30 participants traveling on Kenya Airways. Your departure time from the hotel is 11 a.m. 11 a.m. Kenya Airways. There are participants traveling on Trans Air. You have to leave the hotel at 1 p.m. All on Saturday. And there are participants traveling on Air France Delta Cos Air. Your departure time from the hotel is 7 p.m. on Saturday. Saturday night, 
For people traveling on Rwanda Air, Ethiopian Air Mauritania, your departure time is 4 a.m. That's Saturday getting into Sunday, 4 a.m. And then for people traveling on Kamer, Kamer, your departure time is 10.30 a.m. on Sunday. 10.30 a.m. on Sunday. Please take note. There are two participants. <laughs> I'm not sure why your name is here, but Carlos Cardozo and Ramola Ramtolo. Your departure time is 1.30 p.m. 1.30. And then there are six people traveling on Tunis Air, SN Brussels, Iberia. Your departure time is Sunday at 6 p.m. Okay? This information will also be at, available at your hotel in case um, you don't get this. And we hope to put it on the door of the little Codestria office just outside. And if you have questions, please let us know. But as you can see, the airport is out of town. A lot of the time there is no traffic. Sometimes there is traffic, so you are leaving relatively early because even during normal times, it takes at least one hour to get there. Sometimes a lot more, depending on traffic. Thank you and have a good day. I'm going to invite uh, Mr. Fall to play us a song as we wait for our keynote address. Mr. Fall. Yes, yes. Bonjour, tout le monde. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, my English. My English is not uh, <laughs> very good. That's why I used to express myself on, uh, on French. <laughs> bon, tout d'abord, je tiens à vous dire que c'était un, euh, un grand plaisir pour moi euh, d'avoir... Euh, eu à jouer mes sons pour cette édition de la Côte d'Esprit. Et j'anticipe pour vous dire au revoir. Je ne sais pas si j'aurai l'opportunité de le faire. Donc je vais anticiper pour vous dire au revoir. Et pour aujourd'hui, je vais vous jouer, je vais vous interpréter un son qui s'appelle Lamban. Lamban, à l'origine, était destiné au griot. C'était une fête organisée par le roi et qui était destiné à rendre grâce aux griots. Parce qu'on sait que dans l'Empire Mandeng, c'est les griots qui transmettaient tous les messages. Et du coup, euh, le roi a profité de cette occasion pour rendre grâce aux griots. C'est dans ce contexte que s'inscrit ce son Lamban. Merci.
Good morning, everyone. There is some evidence in the room that uh, it's the last day of the General Assembly. And there is some evidence in your voices that indeed it's the last day of the General Assembly. So good morning again. Thank you very much. Um, it is my pleasure this morning uh, to welcome you to the final day of our General Assembly, um, and uh, we lined up two scientific panels for this session. And so I would like to take this opportunity to welcome uh, Professor Kofi Anidoho uh, from the University of Ghana, Legon, uh, to take charge of the session and run it through. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. If you detect a bit of the nasal in my speech, it's not coming from a ghost. A um, bit of a cold. Yesterday, we had a special treat from Professor Wole Shoinka speaking as a creative artist. We continue this morning and I'd like to be brief at this point and call Dr. Mwangola to introduce the speaker. Listen carefully to the titles of her works and see if you can detect something in there. Dr. Mwangola. Thank you, Prof. Good morning, everyone. It is indeed a privilege to be invited to introduce to the Codestria community gathered here and all those who have joined us our end note lecturer as we begin to wind down on what I am sure you will agree with me has been a very stimulating and successful conference. With your permission, as we are dealing with the storyteller, I would like to begin with a story. 
When I was working on my doctoral dissertation, it was Yvonne War who gave me the definition of story that I used then, speaking of it as the crafted, creative representation of lived experience, real or imagined. This is a definition I continue to use now in my own research, teaching, and practice. Since I only have a few minutes to set the stage for her presentation, let me borrow from her own wisdom to give you not just a dry recounting of biographical facts, but also convey a little of the essence that brings her here before us today. This is actually a story that is still unfolding as the matter is still in court, so I will have to be very careful about what I say publicly about it. And yes, don't worry. I have asked her permission to tell you this particular fragment of her story. In August this year, Yvonne was standing outside a mall in Nairobi, Kenya, when the city council inspectorate descended upon some Kenyan citizens who had set up informal food trading spaces just opposite the mall. This food market generally serves a lot of people working in the mall and in the office buildings, businesses, and residences in this affluent area of Nairobi, people who generally cannot afford to either eat at this mall or the restaurants in the vicinity. Those of you familiar with the history of Nairobi will know its genesis as a colonial city, and this past is very much part of the fabric in the, of the way the city runs even today. One of the enduring legacies of this history is the way in which the city inspectorate, or the Kanjo Council Ascaris as we call them, still brutally criminalize poverty. Manifest in the routine raids carried out to enforce city bylaws against hawkers and informal traders is a lot of physical, psychological, and soul-crushing violence. So anyway, Yvonne, who was standing outside the mall waiting for a taxi, gets caught up in the raid, and is arrested, and later that afternoon, charged in court with trading in fruits without a license, <laughs> dumping in such a manner as to cause litter, abusing an officer, and resisting arrest. So as the word spreads, several of us go down to the county headquarters at City Hall to find out what is happening, where we find that she has already been charged in court, and that she was the only one among the many arrested that day to plead not guilty to the charges, and furthermore, that she can only be released on bail, which finally happens at the end of a long afternoon. So this is what I want to briefly draw attention to in this story. First, the response of the majority of Kenyans on hearing this story, not just her kith and kin, but including the general public when the story gets on social media and carried in both local and international media, was to express shock at what many first termed as her naivety, and later, foolish courage, for daring to stand for her rights, speak out to the um, city Ascaris, whom she lectured on the rights and responsibilities of public servants, and in pleading not guilty. One thing people said over and over again, that her innocence was really irrelevant in a situation like this. Practically everyone knows to plead guilty, pay whatever fine just so that you can get out and avoid even more grief. Think of this, if you like, as one of the hidden taxes of living in Nairobi. The other thing that caused a lot of comment was that when the commotion started, she did not, as a privileged member of the Kenya's elite, run into the mall for safety. In fact, one of the county officials asked her, is she a visitor to Nairobi that she doesn't know to run when she sees Kanjo doing their work? Another of these officers expressed outrage that when she was seized by these men who were beating everyone in sight and grabbing people, she dared ask questions about why they were doing this and then did not meekly go along with them but struggled. This was largely the response in the media. Second, Yvonne's reaction, and this has not only generated a lot of comment but is also the catalyst from the for the beginnings of a, a movement uniting several of the interest groups already working in Nairobi around the notion of a just and safe city for all was that it is important that those of us who can take a stance, not only to challenge injustice, but also to stand for the constitutional right to human dignity for the most vulnerable of Nairobi citizens. I am sure those of you who listened to the Leopold Sedar Senghor lecture 
I reminded of Professor Shoinka's discussion on this question of human dignity and our responsibility as intellectuals to go beyond the important work we do in documenting and theorizing about the human condition to ensuring that our work, lives, and actions matter and make a difference to the human beings who live out the consequences of that which we study. Now, when Yvonne was finally released to us, we found that she had been roughed up during the arrest, her clothes were torn, she had some injuries, and during the melee, she lost her jacket, her spectacles, her phone, and when they were dragging her to the county van, her bag had also been grabbed away from her, although this was later returned. So naturally, we were all very concerned about this. However, what stays with me is that the first thing she said when she told us about her losses was, at least they did not take away my notebook. Everything else I had on me, I could replace, but not my notes. By the way, while in the holding cell and without her spectacles, Yvonne made good use of the time and her field notebook to conduct research. And for what purpose? Let me quote from an interview she gave to the Standard newspaper on this experience, in which she says of her coming book, whose working title is The Long Decay, that it is, and I quote, deeply Nairobi. It is the story of a man who has to make peace with his own demons. And part of that is to understand the place where he lives. And that is Nairobi. She is convinced that she has found the most profound encounter with Nairobi that a city resident can have. And here the interviewer quotes her, now I know it is right at City Hall. I'm not blinking about this. I thank the Nairobi City Council. I have needed a villain for the, the new novel. They have provided me with not only experiential research, but the ideal villain, she says. The villain could be an Askari, an official, or the whole system. I will now personalize the system, she says. Story, the crafted, creative representation of lived experience. And so on to the question that one of the county officials that they asked as realization began dawning upon them that this was not going to be business as usual. Kwani, huyo Yvonne Owar ni nani? Just who is this Yvonne Owar? In response, I would say she's a writer, best known for her award-winning short story, Weight of Whispers, and debut novel, Dust. She has also written and published a number of other stories and essays, as well as screenplays. Weight of Whispers, her very first published piece, won the Kane Prize for African Writing in 2003, while Dust, whose publication coincided with Kenya's 50th anniversary of flag independence in 2013, won, amongst several accolades, the country's most prestigious literary prize in 2015. The former explores the harrowing lived experiences of members of a refugee family fleeing into exile from the post-genocide ravages of their home country into the uncertainty of a future where everything they once were slowly unravels, while the latter delves into the lives and stories of another family that stands, if I may borrow an expression from Dr. Ken Walibora's presentation yesterday, as an analogy for a nation suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. In March next year, Yvonne's second novel, Dragonfly Sea, will be published. And I would be remiss if I did not mention that this is a book answering Professor Fatima Harak's challenge to us in her presentation in the keynote panel on our first day to carefully engage with the long durée of globalization and indeed of globalization as experienced by African peoples. It is also in conversation with President Tabombeki's insightful Sheikh Anta Diop lecture, urging us to, amongst other things, engage critically with China. And I could go on and on and point out the many ways in which her writings speak to, speak to so many of the conversations we have had this week, not only in the plenary, but also in our panels, including, for example, the way she engages with the driving concerns and discourses around religious fundamentalism, as well as the challenges faced by Africans of the contemporary diaspora negotiating their way to finding and making home away for the, from the homes of their ancestry. But since I am not the one invited to give the lecture, let me leave it there. I will say, however, that in addition to her undergraduate degree from Kenyatta University in Kenya and a master's from the University of Reading in the UK, Yvonne also has an MPhil in creative writing from the University of Queensland in Australia 
and considers the years spent living and working a variety of jobs in a different countries, including, yes, Nomsa, Eswatini, South Africa, the, UA, the UK, Tanzania, and Kenya, as part of the education preparing her for the work she now does as a writer and public intellectual. Before committing to full-time writing, Yvonne worked as a member of the academic planning team for the proposed East African Faculty of Arts and Sciences of Aga Khan University, where she was, amongst other things, responsible for the development of the fine arts and new media curriculum. She also served as executive director of the Zanzibar International Film Festival for, for several years. In general, she has substantive experience in arts management, curriculum development, conservation, development communications, event production, and digital technology. Let me include then with a line from a poem by the chair of this session, Professor Kofi Anidoho, with his permission, and to make this sense, make sense, share just one small other tiny fragment from her story. One day, Yvonne calls me in excitement to tell me about the great day she's just had conducting field research with the pathologists and morticians in one of Nairobi's busiest funeral homes, joining them inside the morgue itself as they conducted their duties as a way of better understanding a theme she turns to again and again in her work, death, or as she says, trans transition to the next phase. The singular courage to go where most of us would rather not venture, to go not only willingly, but to choose to linger there, to stay, to explore, to ask questions, to plumb deeply into that which most of us would rather not delve into is something I find truly compelling about Yvonne. She considers it a calling. And like her friends, the pathologists, her time in these, limited, in these liminal spaces where death's power is ever omnipresent is a necessary journey undertaken in search of our healing. I suspect, and we shall soon find out if I am right, that this is what has inspired the title of her keynote lecture, Digging into Shadows, These Haunted Realms. And so, to slightly change Professor Anidoho's phrasing in his poem, Praise Song for the Land, the eloquence of this storyteller is a searchlight through nightmares. It is a walking stick in the cripple's hands, a key to secret doors that lead to the treasure caves of the soul of life. Her song of sorrow is a path of mastery through the mysteries of life, of death. Her song of sorrow is our ultimate song of joy. Distinguished colleagues, our 2018 General Assembly Endnote Lecturer, Yvonne Aviambo Owo. Are we set up? Ah, okay, there we are. Uh, Dr. Mushai Mwangola, thank you so, so much. Uh, you truly honor me. And uh, I'm truly honored to be here. Uh, thank you for the privilege of being able to stand here and speak to you. Well, very, very distinguished guests. Oh, good. Which button did you push? Next, okay. Ah, oh, okay, okay, all right. Very distinguished guests. The Cordestria President, Executive Secretary, Executive Committee, and because I used to run a festival, I must thank those who are behind the scenes, the teams involved in putting this thing together. Scholars, friends, ladies and gentlemen, a good morning to you all. Uh, what a pleasure it is to be here among you in this the largest and most diverse gathering of African social scientists on the continent. What ideas, what a stimulant, what a treasure. Thank you for the opportunity to be here in a place 
about which my heart has long dreamt of and which I'd only visited through history, fantasy, music, and its personalities. I realize that I am an interloper, but a most grateful one, who will also spread the, wor the word, unfortunately, so that the next time you shall be inundated by the many strange creative types and might experience a pang of regret for having invited me today. But good news must be shared, and I have a big mouth. <laughs> Dr. Godwin Murunga, my brother, you cajoled me into visiting and then pinned an end note to me. This is supposed to be a rousing summation of the days of our event, and indeed, what days these have been. What thoughts, what power, what words, what a people, what beauty. And I do desire to do justice to the call, my friend. And I will weave in the treasured contributions of the many here, and these may show up in different forms, including questions. But please, can we call this something else rather than an end note? <laughs> for, the <pa laughs> for the panegyric form fled from me. Furthermore, it is proper to hope that anyone who walks up to this podium approaches it in peace. I confess to you all that I don't. I do not come in peace, nor do I stand here ready to deliver a soothing message. And therefore, I beg your forgiveness in advance for what I will say. For most of it is rooted in unease, in discomfort, in hauntedness, and in a sense of urgency. There may be raw, rough, and rude words involved but I promise you no offense is meant by these. The muse made me do it. Oh, okay. There are several questions, mostly rhetorical, inserted into this summons, this excursion. But if you're tired, for I do acknowledge this is the last day of the conference, there's one question I do ask you to hold in your mind as we traverse the wordscapes. It is the one that guides and informs and dogs my own artistic quests. It's the one that makes me restless. What does it mean for you, for me, to be human now, in this time? Its corollaries include, what does it mean to be human and African today? And what does the humanity of the other mean for you, for us, for me? I am, as you see, poking around the most basic of questions. Figuring out this thing. Oh, I see it's opposite. There is a slideshow, as you can see, um, that accompanies this presentation. Uh, you can also choose to ignore it, and uh, maybe even in just enjoy the colours. They are personal anecdotes. Uh, it's I draw from all sorts of sources, interdisciplinary references. There are some proverbs, um, a couple of conceptual inspirations drum, dropped in, and certainly story ele elements of story. Now, when I refer to Africa, I mean all of Africa, including the alienated territories of Lampedusa, Mayotte, and Reunion, and all our seas, lakes, and rivers, and the Africans of and in other spaces, known and unknown. And since I'm also a Nilot, and in my theology, death is merely a change of form, not the end of existence, I include all past Africans, and those who inhabit the realms beyond my present vision. Also, since I've never seen the line that supposedly demarcates the Sahara not from the south, and my tongue has never been able to speak that useless sub-Sahara thing with any seriousness, for the purposes of this, ses of this session, I suspend the existence of that nonsense. As so generously mentioned, I don't know, this thing is haunted, isn't it? As so generously mentioned, I am at present an author, but have been many other things before, including a development worker, for which I repent, and a corporate climber, best not spoken about ever again. 
I'm also a creature of Africa from the geographical space called Kenya. I am one of the representatives of the so-called post-colonial generation and therefore suffer both its delusions and discontents. This has made me an African tomb wanderer, a ruin seeker, sifting through the debris of broken African promises. There is not one rhapsody of Africa that I do not know. I know the frenzy of the time of the African Renaissance and all the songs of the African Rising album. But the ceaselessly crashing hopes have made of me a citizen ghost, trying to protect a badly repaired heart from being broken again and again. I am deeply sympathetic to those who leave the continent. I used not to be, for I get the seduction of hope that, it is, that is greater than death. The risk of finally living and gambling for a chance to breathe as a human whose safety is somewhat guaranteed. I may appear fortunate because I have the privilege of a passport and veneer that allows me to roam the rest of the world with some sort of legitimacy. But like my brothers and sisters in pursuit of chimerical dreams, I have felt the dagger twist of that homelessness that accompanies Africa beingness away from the continent. This is the fate of those who are doomed to love this splendid, damned realm. To survive her, I make myself a witness, observer, and traveler of territories from which I derive tales. This is what it means to be African now. As if, and if my witness and observation includes that of our dead, our dying, our destroyed, so be it. Digging into shadows. From my cultural milieu, there is a legend of a mighty military man a commander-in-chief whose military feats were unassailable, who despite all attempts at wounding his body, would neither bleed nor die. His name was Luanda Magere. His legend traversed all landscapes. No expeditions dared confront him or his army from Kano. Kano's closest neighbors and livestock raiding frenemies defeated several times by Luanda's army, were kept fearful and restless about the situation. After a while, they decided to sue for peace. Included in the peace package was a most alluring female, the symbol of a peacemaking that would confirm a future secured by blood relationships. Luanda Magere, feeling affirmed in his virility against the wise counsel of his one and only wife, confirmed all aspects of the deal in the manner of a long line of African negotiators who do not take the advice of those who actually know better. <coughs> the years eased along and there was some domestic bliss. Still, Luanda, Luanda's raiding expeditions elsewhere continued to meet with great success. But the day came when our hero felt under the weather, a common flu maybe, and the old ways of intravenous medi in medicine, medicine involved applying a razor to the skin in, in order to insert the necessary medicine, ne necessary prophylactics. The first lady had gone to her family and the buxom second wife of peace was, as always, nearby. She tried to cut into Luanda's skin, but the razor splintered. As his flu turned worse and first wife, sole keeper of the secret, was still away, Luanda finally confided in his new beloved and told her that the secret was in his shadow. To heal him, she had to cut into his shadow. She did. The shadow oozed blood. She inserted the herbs into the wound in the ground, hung around long enough for Luanda to heal. And when first wife returned and realized what had happened, she covered her face and told Luanda in not so many words, you are stopped. You know how such things end. Second wife disappears, horns of war sound, battle happens, spear, sniper target, targets Luanda's shadow as second wife watches. Luanda Magaire falls dead, battle is lost. But the good news is that where Luanda fell, his body turned into a stone. It had been in Kano, actually where I come from, for years until the former prime minister's family carried it away into, the family, into his private family museum. Anyway, Legend had it that if you sharpened your war spears on the stone of Luanda, whatever you targeted, you would receive. But I'm interested in that girl, that second wife, the digger into shadows who discovers the hidden source of a warrior's strength and power. There's something of our continent in that woman. Those who have ears, 
let them hear. The idea of life essence embedded in shadows is not uncommon in our various cultural, cultural milieu. The idea certainly among certain coastal communities off the coast of East Africa is that if you want to capture the essence of someone, wait for his or her shadow and dig up the soil around it. Shadow as prognosticator and once read exposed to light for a certain kind of healing to occur. I have been playing with the word haunted in the title and tried to imply its original meaning. Haunted originally meant a place to which one returns. I was playing it with it because of its more current meaning, a realm in which ghosts gather and refuse to leave. There are some conceptual underpinnings that inform my position here. I have been enthralled by the thoughts, mostly of the South Americans, namely Anibal Quijano, who helped expand and deepen the notion of coloniality, Walter Mignolo, Enrique Duzel, Santiago Castro Gomez, who coined the phrase, the hubris of point zero, with references to the dominant paradigm enforced by extremes of violence that positions European cultures as the primary culture of universal reference, a replacement god from which a universal fiat tumbles supported by the pillars of modernity, including capitalism, reason, but only as defined by anointed thinkers, economics, neoliberalism, and a theology of science with its dogma of secularity. Quijano and the others had anticipated a time like this, as a, a, a time as this long season of ferment, what you're calling the crisis of globalization. For to crudely paraphrase them, there's a, only a limited time period that bullshit can endure. That the world is in ferment now is no secret. The world is in such flux and has been for a long, long time. Some major historical processes are underway. Some major civilizational shifts are unfolding. Uncertainty, disquiet. Renewed local, regional, and global tribalisms. This is a world where our certainties are crumbling. We are in a season of the world where one of the most significant struggles is that of giving a name to the realities of our now. We might also be preparing ourselves for yet another war, the risk of more mass bloodletting. But this season also exposes our African contradictions and fractures in fresh new ways so that the things hidden are coming into light. As African citizens, we have become more aware and are willing to admit that those to whom we entrusted our sovereign dreams and imagination have taken these to a roulette table and lost the nations on the roll of dice. We do not know the full extent of the brokered betrayals yet, but we can now admit that we have been here before, haven't we? Now we can admit that many of our ancestors during those first, first colonial ventures in, venturings in the 19th century were not mere bystanders or victims. Many colluded with the invaders to wound their own people. And so the national myths we have used to justify our venality, our tribalism, are also falling apart. And that is a good thing. What this time means for us as Africans in Africa and elsewhere, though, is less certain. And though the state of globalization might be in a crisis, it might be a crisis for others, in a continent that has stumbled from crisis to crisis to crisis anyway for over 400 years, this turbulence is just one of many. If we might dare to imagine it differently, maybe this also represents a new opportunity to try to call forth a new vision for who we are, who we can be, and how we want to be in the world. Speaking of vision and imagination, I once told university students that every child is born with a mythic imagination. How my youngest brother, when he was four years old, believed he was Shaka Zulu and would reprise the role day after day, fighting, winning, dying, rising again, and starting the process all over the next day. But then the students reminded me that most dreaming African children also fall into the hands of adults, parents, teachers, priests, and the National Examination Council will proceed to squeeze any enduring mythic sensibility out of them until a perfect clone will emerge who will then be able to perpetuate past foolishness with its brand of self-preserving mediocrity. 
and again, we force a madness and a sadness upon a young generation who must not dream of finding new stars, who will learn to mistrust dreams unlike their peers elsewhere, a generation raised to understand that stars exist to be reached by others, never then, never Africans. For if you cannot dream of stars, your leaders can pretend to be suns and moons. Uh, good, uh, th that's the presidential motorcade of the president of Djibouti. <laughs> For if you cannot dream of stars, your leaders can pretend to be suns and moons. So as they beam upon you on their rush to their so many elsewheres, you must dance around and venerate them and die for and hack elections for them and forget the power of your own story lying moldering in your heart. Godwin is not here, but I wanted to tell him, I'm really sorry that a representative group of the under 20s are not here in this place. For these are the identity formation years. And right now for the many, it's the internet feeding and fueling their imagination of themselves because the pulse of energy of thought they crave and imagine and seek is unavailable and inaccessible on this content, uh, in, is unavailable and inaccessible. And what I've found right here is that the pulse of that which they seek. Here in this place, I have found aspects of Wakanda and its treasures. And you're concealed here, you're hidden here, while your people elsewhere long to know that they too are splendid. They too are splendid indeed. You see, as long as, as, long as we do not make gatherings like these accessible, our next generation will never know that they too can dream daring dreams, that they too can propose and hear soaring questions. As long as we do not make spaces like these available and ideas like these available and elders and minds like this accessible to the generation that will be longing below you, you keep them vulnerable to those who make no bones about distributing their imagination by all means necessary. I am convinced, I have long been convinced that the primary African crisis is not globalization, it's that of imagination its perversion, its diminution. The most significant indicator of this crisis is our seeming inability to evolve a lexicon certainly for our shadows, our suffering, our horror, and all our de devastating humiliation and losses. I mentioned these, the shadow spaces of our being, because in these lurk the terrible suffocating demons that prevent the inner liberation that we all seem to crave, the subtext of the subtext in our many urgent questions here. And those of us who have a relationship with the world's not seen are also probably conscious of that exquisite word, exorcism. Ah, there we are. Professor Kofi and Ido prov provided me when we were having this discussion, talked to me about, you know, that, that you know, when, we, when we mentioned this, the shadows and the hidden spaces, he says, yes, um, uh, our ghosts are familial. They only trouble the person Ah, uh, it's spelling mistake, they know. You have heard that in order to overcome an invasive, possessive, unknown, and disturbing presence that fragments inner and outer words, its name must be called out, it must be named, and it is the naming and the omission of that naming that actually is the most wretched, the most difficult part of the ritual. If as a people, a collective, we still struggle, struggle to tell the fullest stories of us, the light and the darkness, at least to ourselves. How then can we imagine evolving and articulating a coherent and meaningful worldview? Whatever we speak out will be full of holes. How can we situate ourselves in the world with stability and certainty? How do we expect the fragmented story of us to contain us all? A people who leak their dreams who lurch from episode to episode without resolution. We know and feel that there is something wrong, something out of place and disordered. How is it possible that a place of such wealth, such obscene wealth, laden with the treasures the whole world craves, how is it that we can still wallow in degradation? 
There is something wrong when a people distinguished by their beauty and imagination struggle to rise and rise and keep sinking into new and deeper mires. It is tragic when we hoard the secret in our hearts that in order for so many of us to know our excellence as human beings because of what our nations have made of us and made of themselves, in order to breathe and live and touch our transcendence, we often have to leave home, leave the continent. The same continent that the world seeks out because it is here that they can make their wealth. What happened to us? My friend, the regional gadfly and writer and journalist Kalundi Serumaga, in his much shared piece in the journal The Elephant, titled The Collaborators, an obituary of the African Independence Project, I highly recommend reading this, does so well what I had actually planned to do with you that I can only offer a backup echo. His piece goes straight for the jugular of a class of scoundrels who have a long history in the decimation, destruction, and deconstruction of our continent, who are responsible with what he calls the termination of the independence project. Our parade of exceptional diabolic entities, whose souls drip with the blood and suffering of our own, those who roam the world like Satan, dressed in African diamonds, while summoning their masses to wear shirts and shorts adorned with their ugly faces, who own mines and plains and castles and streets in London and Paris, and offer the presidential suites in European hotels to, their fet to the fetishers they travel with. Yes, I went there. Whose only role is to figure out new ways of consuming their people's souls and lives and futures. They have sold our wealth in private deals with foreigners, and then they make themselves the sole beneficiaries of the treasures of our land who feel nothing when informed that their people are the most destitute in the world. They are so eager for election seasons, which they have turned into seasonal blood fests and blood hunts in co collaborations with their sneaky, nasty friends like the former Cambridge Analytica. A friend I was speaking to told me that we are people who lust after our own blood. How many times have I heard here that elections are coming soon, repeated as if we are the house of Stark, Winter is coming. Game of Thrones, for those who do not know. Kalundi refers to the transatlantic slave trade, which he terms the industry that birthed the modern world, the trade in Africans destined to be enslaved. It was not a small thing, he says. It lasted over three and a half centuries, creating a particular historical trajectory. The establishment of such a permanent trade converted domestic slavery into an international business and created an intermediary African economic class with a mercenary mindset. He categorizes, he classifies the intermediary African in three broad groups. The first, he says, is the homemade self-appointed agent to foreign commercial needs who enabled the weaponization and transformation of domestic slavery. Some were bona fide native potentates who saw the chance to get rich and dispose of their enemies, but usually just to get rich. By 1700, he reminds us, the, king, the kingdom of Wida, now in present-day Benin, Benin, was exporting nearly 1,000 Africans a month. From 1704, when King Hafon ascended the throne, that's King Hafon. I was just going to say, I was going to say, he reminds me of some of our leaders. I'll restrain myself. Uh, when King Hafon ascended the throne, the kingdom was considered a bastion for European slave, slave traders who Hafon protected. Sounds familiar? Another type of intermediary African was the enterprising kind who simply emerged from the community, the hustler. Some had previously been traders in other things, maybe even chicken, while others were mere adventurers. Another group were basically warlords masquerading as native kings or chiefs in order to present themselves as having the authority to capture and sell other Africans. The embryo of a nimble and agile socio-economic class marked by a culture of cynicism, venality, opportunism, and a whole lot of stupidity. This class would be mass produced through the mission school, Kalundi tells us, and would rise to political preeminence all over Africa. Serumaga then leads us to the crux of his argument. 
that we can see of ourselves from the outcome of the trade in enslaved Africans, the madness this new class got up to, sanctioned and enabled by the then global powers, has created the template for the Africa we live in today. Substitute the word slave for minerals, or aid money, or Colton, and the word, word, words castle and palace courtyard for foreign investor and state house, respectively. And basically, he says, you're transported to many an African capital city today. He concludes, welcome to us. Kalundi then cited uh, Nigerian writer Adaobi Nwabwani, New Yorker's article. It is fascinated in that it's another, it's, an, it's, a, it's the whole thing of the inheritance of, the inheritance of ghosts, the inheritance of wounds. Hers is a, 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 a generational down the line admission of shadows known in the family but not yet articulated. I'd read, read Adaobi's article and I was struck that in so many ways and what is relevant to our session is the reality of the persistence, not only of ghosts, of restlessness, of the things we know, the unease, the sense of an existential wrong done, that even if it is not spoken out loud down the centuries, lingers, persists, and is passed down generation after generation until it is admitted to. And even if the grandfathers don't admit it, it seems that we're doomed, someone down the line is doomed to admit it. I was curious then, what does slavery then mean in terms of hauntings for our continent? It's a fundamental betrayal of the core of what it means to be human. We did it. What it means to be human in community, the ritualized sale of and spilling of human blood generating binding covenants. I was gonna say, and remember the history of what is articulated when the story of the first willful spilling of human blood is told. Blood speaks, blood is restless. The commodification of existence, the erasure of human existences by silences, the betrayal of destiny. And this abomination perpetuates itself. Today, before I got here, I decided to do a quick survey of which one of our African newspapers make any reference to our people who are making their way across passageways, uh, of, of passageways leading for the myth of a future in Europe by way of sea, where 70% of them will either drown or die in the desert. There's not one, not a single bloody one. We are also a bleeding, dying people whose deaths do not seem to matter, not even to ourselves. Forgive me. As I speak to you, perhaps, as I speak to you, perhaps in this second Hundreds of our men, women, and children are dying in the desert, drowning in the Mediterranean Sea, being captured and enslaved, for murdered, raped, sodomized, sold for body parts. Last year, a cynical but sad European doctor friend told me that at least now the human organ supplies in Europe are regular. Of those who leave, less than a quarter survive, less than a quarter arrive. And of these, most disappear along the way where hubs have been established to harvest human body parts, to harvest our people's human body parts, to acquire and sell women and children. We know this, we have been told by others, but we do not speak of it, do we? We choose not to see, right? But the amnesia is no longer viable, my people. I am currently sojourning in Berlin, in the parks and in the train stations at night, the image of the half-lives of our survivors. The unwanted humans crowd my soul. And even if I deny it, I don't want it. In their eyes, in their skin, in the hauntedness, these are mirrors. My discarded people, my wasted people, our men, our women, but mostly, yes, our men. And I tru truly do not give an owl's hoot about what justifications exist that explain the situation. Truly, I don't. I'm neither an academic academician nor a politician. I'm merely one human being traversing this world and noting what I observed and doomed to ask a child's question, why? Mm. 
most of these hanging in parks of Europe, destitute, hanging, staying, lingering in train stations, empty at, at midnight so that they can get a bit of warmth. Begging, digging into, digging into bins to pick up the discarded remains of other people's food. Why? Most of, if these are Africans, when these are Africans, are from countries where octogenarians and nonagenarians have a stranglehold on the soul of their nation. Creatures from the darkest of depths who rule their nations from hotel suites in Europe. Entities whose largest armies are made up of thieves and fetishers whose primary role is to consume the life of their people, their nation, their continent, and who, who pour blood to doom their very own. Look at us. There's a phrase we popularized in Kenya after the 2013 election, accept and move on, move on. It was assumed that the diabolic violence of the, our post-election violence could be commanded into silence, could be made to disappear. But the violence and, it goes, and its ghosts keep interfering with our present, feeding from it. We know no psychological peace and are caught up in an eternal death roll of a putrefying form of corruption. If we are not dying physically, we are dying spiritually. We are consuming ourselves and subjecting our children and the future to a display of a disgusting inner corrosion. The cartography of our African woundedness remains unmapped and hidden. But we know it, we feel it. We have evolved an infrastructure that buries scars, conceals our shame, scapegoating, marginalizing, diminishing, dehumanization, judgment of, disconnection from kindred, haven't we? We conceal our insecurities by waging silent wars on each other, mostly because we are afraid to admit to our fears, our insecurities, the memories that haunt, memories that most often than not, most often, memories that most often than not are not even from our own direct experiences, but we feel it in our bones, in the things we do not say, in the silences within our families and communities. And whether we like it or not, we know what our forebears did. Am I wrong? I have asked this before, allow me to ask it again. As a continent, have we ever grieved our betrayals, defeats and losses, certainly of the notions of self, family, community, worldview, gods, goods, stories, time, spaces, land, archetypes, and imagination. It's not just about colonialism. This is about wars fought and lost so thoroughly, little is left of the memory of old victories. Have we mourned what it means when for centuries men could not protect or provide for their families, and women and mothers could not shield and protect their children, and children could not rely on their parents to keep them safe or, or guarantee them a future? For the war has been a long one. It started in 1884, and it is a war, and the war is horrible. And have we apologized to the ancestors that were betrayed by our own? Have we interceded on behalf of the ancestors that did the betraying? The past is omnipresent, you see, and it can act as a trap of the future if it is not reckoned with. And yet our leaders blithely troop colors with tin men armies men and women whose bodies we shall offer as cheap sacrifices for other people's wars, who are doomed to win no real war because the weapons given to them are usually obsolete. Here we are dressed up like the resplendent toy soldiers in Tchaikovsky's, Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker Suite and just as useful. We put a pot-bellied man wearing more medals than sense in a motorcade flanked by grown men hanging off the windows of cars, their butts sticking out when our people are turned into lemmings. My people, what name can we give to this psychic disorder that afflicts our communities, our nations, our lives? What has shattered us so thoroughly that we cannot even raise a dirge over our dying? What does it mean when a people cannot even adapt their lives to ensure their own survival? Who are the monsters that terrify us so that we are paralyzed against the existential onslaught that, if it continues, will guarantee in a hundred years the end of us? What happens when the rules and regulations governing the desecration of life are ignored? Accursedness, someone calls it. 
but break it down, a paralysis, an inability to progress, not just materially, but morally, a disintegration of society, an incapacity to dream of a future. And the human being becomes, at some point, a thing that not even a self-respecting pig would wish to be associated with. Remember the pigs from the reading of the demoniac of Gerasene who committed mass suicide rather than be associated that, was that, that which had inhabited a man. Don't worry, you staid scholars and academicians, nervous about the language I'm using. Let me give you a more solemn reference for what I just said. I refer to Edward Tick, The War on the Soul. For a long time, he too has examined and explored the meaning of the restless hauntedness of so many war veterans. He no longer uses the word post-traumatic stress, he uses the word moral injury. I do not have the time to dwell on this, but I'm going to show you some of the indicators which are picked from some of his texts and other people's texts. Um, I'm sure you'll recognize some of the words. Some of the, some of the words will be of resonance, right? a diversion. There's power in the stories we tell and the stories we do not tell ourselves and the stories that others offer to us about us and also about themselves. Beyond the word, images and notions of a paradigm is actually an original story that leads to the site, that leads to the place that we are, we are calling globalization. This is a story that grew, that became the way the world started to believe it was and then started to experience this. Instruments were installed to solidify this story, and a group gathered around its aspects to make it real. The story as it spread relied on perception of its absoluteness, its omnipotence. It reinforced itself through art and acts of persuasion, seduction, as it faked its control of the past, present, and most significantly, the future. It was intelligent enough to understand that it always needed to invent the future and its language, a constant aspect that keeps it going. It was also willing to apply extremes of violence unto death in order to retain its privilege, prestige, and power. In 2016, Argentinian Semitian Walter Mignolo gave a lecture on global coloniality and the world disorder, where he tells of how Pope Alexander VI, in 1484, in the Treaty, treaty, of, Tord uh, in the treaty of Tordesillas, took possession of unknown lands, which is the rest of the world, and then divided the world between Spain and Portugal, laying the foundations of what we come to call the East and the West. The point I'm trying to make is all of these are constructed, someone's imagination. You know, someone draws a line East and West, and suddenly we, everything we write, uh, we assume that these things become real, right? East and West, Mignolo reminds us, is a papal and also monarchical fiction that becomes ontological reminds us, uh, we, Mignola against reminds us, there was no Western civilization as we know it today until the 16th century. The narrative of the Renaissance consolidated, popularized, and revised the idea of Western civilization, according to Mignolo. He reminded his audience that international law was also an invention of the 16th century that became necessary to justify the planetary land grab, which of course included parts of Africa. Mignolo observed that before this consolidation and appropriation of the lives and lands of others, the world order was what he calls pluricentered. There, no there was no one single civilization that impinged heavily upon others, even though there was extensive global commerce. Mignolo goes on to say a lot of fascinating things that you can look at yourselves if you wish. But what is useful for this particular excursion is that it's a confirmation that nothing actually stops our continent from also imagining itself as a hegemonic, as a hegemonic force in this season of flux. 
that the hegemonic paradigm that consigned us to hell is limping, that we can dare to take advantage of that situation for our advantage and those of the coming generations. But to do so, to do so, we require an act of daring, and that act of daring means to look within. Anyway, everything has a beginning and is linked to a single or collective imagining that creates worlds. I re-echo Professor Fatma Harak's note that there was once a rest beyond the West, and this season of hegemonic breakdown is not as exceptional as you imagine it to be, with the benefit of historical lenses. When I listened to Jomo Sundaram's intervention, I was struck by the notion of saplus a change, saplu la même. Our 21st century affirmation of 400-year-old deeds elicit financial outflows from the continent, but that is the fundamental basis of the existence of contemporary Africa. The hemorrhaging has been continuous for 400 years. A story maker working on a character profile would have looked at Sundaram's presentation and said, of course, of course, that is the natural tra trajectory of that story. I also thought it was rather sweet that in President, President Becky's anecdote, African delegations expected that the G8 were actually going to take their NEPAD project seriously. Really. I'm actually mostly amused that they were surprised that within a few years there, were, there was not even a pretense of any other business on the G8 agenda. What did we expect? Of course, if, of course if, if it was happening now, the situation, of course, would be different. Uh, okay, that was the treaty, sample of the Treaty of Tordesia. We do owe China, frankly, a debt, a certain debt of gratitude. If they had not implemented their vision plan for us, the economist would have published more of the doomed, hopeless continent narrative, which they put out, I still remember the date, May 12th, the year 2000. And the Euro-Americans would have continued to insist that they can only fund the village borehole and mosquito nets since we really do not need roads. For which we should be grateful while, sleight of while their sleight of hand ravishes our titanium, Carlton, and diamonds. It is amusing to watch the Occidental media and their technocrats struggle now to find another lexicon, another way of speaking Africa that's not contemptuous because they have to be a, lo a little more careful now. Yes, it's a cheap thrill. It is a cheap thrill, but it's a thrill nevertheless. But sometimes, as Gunther Nuke, German Minister of Africa, did on November 28th, old habits die hard. Voluntary colonialism, anybody? We are not wanted anywhere. But still our people leave our shores. A light note. A few years ago, I kept sending the International Organization of Migration emails and one letter, which I decorated. Yes, it was a bit mischievous, but I was asking them for figures of north-south migration, particularly the, st the statistics of Europeans who emigrate to Africa. I even sent them a picture of the many, many young econ European economic immigrants in Nairobi and Maputo. But they never replied. My feelings are still hurt. But to the social scientist data cruncher, since statistics are used to make decisions and leverage position, these numbers should not be inaccessible, should they? There is an illusion in so much of Europe, and I'm, I was really surprised that there are people, there is an illusion that there are people actually do not migrate into our continent despite the evidence of our own eyes. And there is no shame in moving, in movement, I want to assure them. And yes, we do need to co-opt the vision of our cherished Professor Yosoyinka about handling the losses of our finest and best. But it would also be useful to have uh, commensurate numbers to share with the Europeans regarding their own economic migrants. And please, none of that crap about the euphemism expatriate, please. Their economic migrants that have been gently welcomed to their new African lives. Anyway, back to the story of our unwantedness. The post-independence state has a perverse imaginative capacity to anticipate what is to come in a country such as Kenya in order to preserve its mediocrity. 
In our fraught election seasons, it seeks out its young, energetic, and talented and employs them to launch warlike social media campaigns. In our, it, it seeks out hackers and bloggers. It knows exactly what it should do with the knowledge, knowledge skills, desire, and desire for transcendence of the youthful ones until it is through with them, until the next cycle, until then. See, see us. Weep, but you won't, especially you, my brothers, because you have believed that you're African and therefore must not be seen to grieve. You must not express your fears, and so you will carry the ghosts from even more centuries until your heart cracks from the weight of it all. Isn't that right? Are you not tired? Our youth. And it is quite disheartening that despite the awareness of their numbers and their skill set and the fact that they have understood that they have the power to change even the politics of their nation and region, these young people are still unable to mobilize themselves to take charge, to force change, given that this is really their time. The truth is that an army of African hackers could quite possibly shut down their countries overnight. And if they wanted to, they would do so without these old malevolent fossils knowing what is happening beneath their noses. I go back to the question, what's the name of the thing that afflicts us? Why does generation after generation circle tombs and graves as if chained to a spot? Why do the ones who have gone before us not bless us? On top of this, it appears that we are people who are compelled it seems to live in the augment, augmented imagination and false realities of others who spend time, energy, and resources studying the ways of human beings in order to gain control over them. And then we fall into line like tiddlywinks, as if we have no intelligence, no imagination, no interest in the question of what it means to be human or African or what it means to own the future. Look at us. The most diabolic wars we have fought since our so-called independence have been wars against ourselves, civil wars, a ceaseless cycle of fratricidal slaughter. Our weapons and war machineries are all directed within so that we ourselves gut our own souls, our own hearts, desecrate our own bodies, offer our oil wells for the chance of access to more guns to use against our own people. Look at us, my people. We have launched an attack on our homes, our families, ourselves, the core of our society, weakening the fabric so thoroughly that we're losing even the language to engage each other. We are willing to use brushes to tar every human being, every man as a paternalistic, chauvinistic monster, and every woman a perpetual voiceless victim, and every child a unit of production that must account for its existence before it's allowed to be born, not once asking ourselves, what does it mean for us to be human? What does it mean for us to be African and human in the world today? Now I'm running out of time, but a very quick story. I think it's important. This is Sakulina. I learned about it from an evolutionary biologist at the Wissenschaft College where I am in residence. So Sakulina is a, a genus of what you call barnacle, a marine-based parasitic castrator of crabs. What this parasite does is to block reproduction in its hosts completely or in part for its own benefit. It frees its host from its rights to aspect of a full life, so that the host, which is the crab, will fully serve the needs of the parasite from the time it's infected to the time of its death, without it actually being aware that it's actually doing so. The crab, the host crab in this case, changes its culture and behavior in the service of this parasite, which approaches it in lava form and settles in a joint where it cannot be detected or removed. The female parasite implanted in the, implanted in the crab means that the crab cannot molt, cannot grow, and is unable to grow claws for its own defense. It fragments itself from the whole, from the whole community of crabs. And it behaves at the behest of this invisible demon, and it serves it with loyalty, even to death. The crab's hormonal balance changes, it becomes sterile, and the male crab's body even changes to resemble a female crab Whitening and flight, widening and flattening, flattening its abdomen, and it performs female mating dances, and develops nurturing behavior, including, including nurturing a brood pouch of the parasite, not its own. It defends this thing against even its own crabs. 
The idea of the control, that a thing, you are not, a thing that is unknown can control the mind, body, history, present, future, and dreams of an organism, that then spends its entire life servicing this unknown parasite's dream, had great resonance for me with regard to reflecting on African spaces. And there are others that if there are no the other kind of parasites, invisible parasites that drive their host even to suicide. Like predation, I read for found from Wiki Wikipedia, parasitism is a type of consumer resource interaction. Wikipedia actually uses that phrase, consumer resource interaction, and for a moment I thought I was reading a World Bank document. <laughs> Try to imagine a way out for the poor crabs, would you? And coming from Africa, coming from Kenya, I'd have a great sympathy for them. But I suspect there was maybe a version of the parasite that sits on the thrones of our many leaders, certainly in Kenya's parliament, just waiting for them to show up. Ah, okay. It's not by coincidence that, you know, it is a coincidence, really. I, I wasn't intending anything. This is John Bolton. He is some sort of security advisor. I think he has a law degree. This is what he has to say about Africa in a speech that harkens back to an old Cold War delusion. I decided to listen to that excruciating speech, that droning voice, in order to believe the contempt, the ignorance, the hubris, the talking over and above and her entire continent, its obsession with China and Russia, as if it's a spurned and entitled suitor. What should an African do with this? Cold War babblings being forced back into existence and this time tinted with American ethno-chauvinism. What are we to do? Wave and nod, wave and nod, as my brother would say, and trust this, the profoundly insecure and insane will just go away and bother others instead? Or do we treat into, into silences, our usual inarticulation before the sustained humiliation by an ass and other idiots he represents, talking above our heads, knowing damn well there's bugger all we can do about it, right? Yet his was a war cry, and we are the bounty. Oh, let me correct that. We are not the treasure. The resources the world needs from our lands is what they want. Our humanity is disposable. Our treasures are not. But do we have the guts to go straight for the jugular of this ass, uh, ass consolidate, mobilize, push back, and ask for a detailed explanation? Perhaps this ill-conceived new Africa plan is bound to fail, given that it has nothing to do with us, but everything to do with a fear of the North American fantasy of China in Africa. However, given the tendency of that jumpy country to wage brutal battles on spurious grounds, there is a need for caution. With a wariness, one extends to a permanent member of the lunatic asylum. Yet this is a strategic opportunity for us. If the metaphorical Occident is afraid of China in Africa, and to some extent Russia, if we were better organized, we could, as a people and region, explore how best to leverage our desirability towards a particular goal, a goal that answers that question. What and how do we want to be in the world today and in the future? If there's an ongoing scramble derived from this retreat of the West from a particular construction of globalization, coupled with a weakening of the one voice Euro-American alliances, what opportunities and constructs offer themselves to us? We shall probably do nothing. The Boltons of this world will source and find some local idiot who will they will, whom they will propel into power and through whom they will diffuse their general stupidity. But for, this just, for just this one moment, we can dream, right? What is the texture of an African imagining capable of rallying African populations and those of the world? a vision that matches up to and transcends the seductive death Im imagination of Daesh, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram, who have branded death as cool while offering a transcendent idea for the young to fight. The death vision, of course, is easier to conceive than a vision of life, you know. But what does all Baghdadi have that you do not have, Godwin? Talk to me, and my pen is poised to take notes. In 2005, in Kenya's post-election violence, I watched my country set itself alight. And, increase, and, and watched the situation in increasing despair, and, a, and, the, and then the cars showed up at the gate of our house. 
and the gate was pounded on with urgency. And I went to see who it was, and there stood my friend, the writer, Binyavanga Wainaina. He was very direct, very clear, very crude in his words. Yvonne, he says, you cannot effing sit here behind walls when our country is effing burning down. We are writers, get your things, we are going. Binyavanga had hired a brave taxi driver and had gone around the city collecting writers and commanding that we travel to the epicenter of our madness. We were so stupid and naive, for we should have asked why we were the only two cars on the national highway. We might have been killed, but at that time it did not matter. We just could not sit still, wringing our hands, waiting for some messiah to swoop down and rescue us from our mass stupidity. Naturally, the politicians were nowhere to be seen in the time of the crisis they had created. Go we did, see we did, write we did, and we forgot to be afraid. Our lives changed differently. Other people chose other parts. I wrote a novel that was also a dirge. The characters had the shapes and bodies of those whom I met, my displaced country people. What I want to say is this, that this is a binyavanga in a taxi season for our continent. I'm calling for a man or woman willing to traverse the continent and summon Im an ima imaginative souls with a clear message. Come, move, imagine, okay, let's get together. The continent needs to imagine a future. The visionaries are already in place. They are already imagining worlds like this. That's Osborne Macharia. And this. Kenyan and that. Yet they're scattered and are striving in isolation with no support from anybody. While a state is still preoccupied, can you believe it, with marketing the country for an imaginary white savior? That's from the Kenya, brand Kenya. Unfortunately, this is a most recent offering, but I believe uh, Dr. Mongola hastily intervened to lower, help lower the cost of their foolishness. Anyway, in this room are some of the most potent minds and hearts with a kind of imagination that if liber liberated from bread and butter jobs and forced into cages and told, think, imagine, could actually create a new world for Africa. The revolution is brewed in between places, mostly of the imagination. In a world where wars are fought by proxies and machines have been imbued with the power of deciding who lives and dies, the old imagination and strategies no longer apply. But we can create a room to call forth what might be, can't we? I imagine a muscular initiatory process to deal with our excessive transparency before strangers. There should be rooms in a family house that are reserved for family alone. Most life-giving initiatory processes are by character, private, secret, shrouded in sacred darkness, but imbued with wisdom and determined to call forth new worlds, new transitions. I did enjoy, as I said, President Tabo Beki's intervention and hope that Kaudesio will gather more of the anecdotes from others. Because apart from his compelling storytelling, these are sources of intelligence. A group dedicated to the task will be able to analyze motives, interests, and subtexts that such experiences reveal, and which can also inform our future negotiation strategies. Especially if we can, as a, na as a continent, consolidate a co collective vision and speak with one voice. From the president's session, it became apparent that we do need some properly trained men and women who are kill, skilled in perception, management, and law, grounded in the psychology and culture of the people with whom our countries negotiate deals. We're also now aware that we mostly send brokers, merchants, vagabonds, rather than negotiators to work out deals for us. As I end this exploration, in lieu of summing statements, I leave you with a couple of open questions. What do we need to do in order to secure the well-being of the heart of our continent? Borrowing the words of the psychoanalyst, Norman Deutsch, how will we turn our ghosts into ancestors who can then bless us, guide us, eavesdrop for us, and intercede? Why are we evolving our agreements with outsiders before we repair the covenants we destroyed among ourselves, before we make covenants for and of ourselves? Given this, how do we make these covenants for ourselves? We may call ourselves Africans, but if I did a poll and asked each one of you what was, Af what, what was Africa in general and for you in less than a sentence, this would become the Tower of Babel. The future is imagined. It is called into being by unusual stories drawn from our deepest imaginings. If we were to Im call this future into existence, what would it look like? How do we name it? What do we need now in order to get there? 
How would it be ordered, governed, and managed? What are we most afraid of? What do we desire most for the continent? How do we converge and bring it into spaces so that a multi-generational cohort with a very specific mandate can call forth new life? What comes first, sovereign national projects or sovereign continental projects? What can we do with the state of African leadership today? Who are we? Who are we in the world? What is Africa's millennium plan? What does it mean to be African tomorrow? What do we want for each other and for the world? How do we want to belong to ourselves and to each other? What does Africa imagine for the world, for all humanity, for nature, for the seas and earths and all their galaxies? What will we do about it? What do we need in order to get there? What is the story of us? How shall we distribute the story of us? To whom, with whom and how? With whom do we gather and talk and dream anew? What is our lexicon? the lexicon of the language of the world we wish to be in. A very quick note, I have been impressed by the presence of our Chinese brethren here and observed them taking notes, listening and adapting presentations to respond to questions and concerns raised. <laughs> I've also been looking around for representatives from our different African governments who have come to gather insight, collect data, gain intelligence. Are they here? And from them, I'd love to ask the Chinese, how do we acquire a millennium mindset as they have, planning for millennia rather than preoccupied with the next general election? How do we move 800 million citizens out of poverty and transform ourselves into a future defining force? Oh, to our Chinese brethren here, please take this back home with you. In the best of ways, we are coming for you. We will challenge your position in the world, but I think we shall remain friends. And we do need to find a way to share a language with each other that's no longer filtered by the old, small, paradigmatic lenses that, can, that are constraining the birth of something new, fruitful, and beneficial for both our worlds. Nevertheless, we are coming for you. Finally, you and I understand and know that our internal liberation might also mean a liberation for a larger world, craving for a new way of ordering itself that may be kinder and human-centered. This season of change is here for all of us, and we are all runners at a common starting line. Theoretically, all humanity has a chance to redefine itself and the world, it seems. However, I may be over-optimistic in thinking we actually have an advantage that we could try to tap into for ourselves and reinterpret for this epoch and its demands. Speaking as a Kenyan and a friend of Ethiopia, I want to affirm to you that we own the marathon. <laughs> Both as metaphor and source of inspiration, scale, motivation, knowing, and reality, we own the marathon. Yeah. Arguably the most challenging, the most splendid test of the spirit, strength, resilience, endurance, and strate strategic vision of a human being and the one human in the world who has dared defy the limits of the human imagination regarding how fast a human can and should run is one of ours. Can we bring Eloiki Choge to talk to us one day about an Afri how an African can conjure up, imagine, believe in, and realize transcendent victories? In this epochal marathon into life, into a new life destiny and a new way of being human, I believe we have a strategic and healthy and steady and strategic stealthy advantage over all others. For we own the marathon and we can, if we cared, learn from its guardians in both the men and women's races. We own the marathon and have owned it for a long, long time. Thank you. We have been privileged as ear witnesses and eyewitnesses 
listening to the storyteller as poet, the poet as storyteller. She's spoken to us in images. At the end of it, she has laid before us a fairly heavy burden. Should we ask questions? If it were in my power, I would say no. We've been asking too many questions. The time is for each of us to search for answers. But that is not my mandate. My mandate is to open the floor to questions. Brief to the point. A few, yes. Um, I thank uh, Vion for that uh, brilliant uh, performance. Um, she started by posing two questions. Uh, what does it mean for you to be human now? Um, and, no, 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 Wait, okay, yeah, three. Uh, and, you know, when I saw that question, something just popped up in my mind, uh, a statement by a character in uh, Shuinka's uh, Mad Men and Specialists called Goi. He says, uh, disgust is cheap. I ask for self-disgust. Um, you begin to hate yourself living in the 21st century. And it doesn't matter where you are, whether in Africa or America. In fact, what is going on in the United States today? That is the largest economy in the world. Everybody is filled with disgust, self-disgust in the world today. And uh, Junka says, look, we are all trapped in this eternal cycle of human stupidity. You know, the most brilliant, most uh, technologically developed. You find that the most barbaric, savage things do go on in such society. So it is not a localized problem. It is a globalized phenomenon. And we are all trapped in it. Then the statement by Sirumaga that uh, independence in um, Africa is obsolete. As a matter of fact, if you cast your mind back to uh, a dance of the forest, that place celebrating attainment of independence, you know, it has a symbol there called the totem, the totem of the tribes. And what is this totem? It's a symbol of bestiality. Say, so what are you celebrating? You know, I make terrible prophecies, not only for Africa, but for the whole world. It's like we are dealing with um, a problem that cannot be defined. You know, it's like all our writers, artists are giving us, you know, an apocalyptic vision. But the consolation is that, as uh, uh, Kofi Aindo who says in one of his collections, after night. Dawn is bound to come. So we are passing through uh, the travel, we are experiencing the travels of night, and we are waiting the birth of dawn. I just hope that uh, before dawn comes, we will not die in the process of being born. Um, so that when the dawn is finally birth, some of us will still be alive to witness uh, the new renaissance. Uh, thank you. A question, yeah, it's over there. Jacques Kambale, je viens de la République. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo et plus précisément du Kivu et beaucoup plus précisément. Merci. Je disais, euh, c'est Jacques Kambale. Je viens de la République démocratique du Congo. C'est pays qui a perdu plus de 6 millions de morts. Et plus précisément du Kivu et des Béni, là où on connaît de massacres à répétition. 
En fait, ma question est celle de savoir est-ce que le mort que nous avons perdu avec la traite négrière, avec la colonisation et avec euh, les guerres euh, civiles et qui n'ont pas eu droit au sépulcre, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas une possibilité dans les cadres des Codestria de trouver un endroit où ces esprits errants euh, doivent trouver un repos Peut-être euh, ici à Gorée pour euh, la période précoloniale, euh, en Afrique du Sud pour la colonisation et en République démocratique du Congo pour euh, les guerres civiles. J'ai dit et je vous remercie. Thank you for your um, question and your comment. Um, your, your insight and your question and your request is a beautiful, um, uh, it's, a, it's not, not only is it a beautiful I idea, it's, it's one of those things that are necessary. And you and I are in the same place because we are both expressing a longing um, uh, where not only can our ghosts be sheltered, um, but they, we can make peace with uh, that which we know. And I'm um, thank you for acknowledging the six million dead in the Congo. I, I it's 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 a, I think it's this the story of our bloodletting, the rivers actually more than the, our rivers of of blood, our, uh, the slaughter of our people it breaks my soul and heart all over all over again. Um, but mostly, what worries me, but what what wounds my own small heart the most is the uh, continued and persistent silences. Uh, but you're acknowledging the six million means that they will never be forgotten. Someone will remember them. So thank you for that. Um, I hope Kadesi can pick up that um, wonderful idea. Yeah, it's in the middle there. Yeah. Bonjour, je m'appelle Frédéric. Uh, je parle anglais aussi. So, um, my question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's not a question, really. I, I really love the presentation because it, it speaks um, uh, very eloquently on a problem I thought is a major problem. That is, we do have a moral crisis. Um, I just wanted to present a situation which is, I think, interesting in the sense of, uh, from your Kenyan experience, uh, um, the SGR railway line, which is a beautiful thing um, given the fact that um, Kenya seems to want to go into the serious industrial whatever and um, um, if you follow from yesterday's news, our deputy president now has a PhD in some science craft, and sh he has been pushing to have our education system towards more science and so on. I'm very interested in the way the SGR GR comes into the story, where um, uh, we seem to enjoy the fact that if you're from Nairobi, you can arrive in Mombasa, you can reach Mombasa in a few hours, as opposed to earlier. And so somehow, we like this uh, Chinese um, invention. But if you follow the stories of the SGR, as the newspapers seem to suggest, it looks as though um, there the, the can be a problem. Of course, if you look at the working hours, and some of the stories came out of there, about workers being caned physically uh, for, for whatever. These stories are replicated elsewhere. I hear stories of this nature coming from places like Zambia and so on. I am interested in if, for example, in 2022, we got a moral leader, say our imagination worked and so on. Um, would we still, I, st I suspect we would still be trapped with this moral leader who doesn't know how to handle this uh, SGR situation. We can't throw away the Chinese. We're already selling the port 
if you follow the news. The Chinese say they are taking over the port because we can't pay back the loans we got from them for the SGR. So it looks like we are trapped. And, and that seems to be speaking to uh, part of the articles you cited, the one where perhaps we are giving ourselves over to the Chinese for a proper, more sexual uh, colonization. Uh, actually, quite. <laughs> the Chinese are not to blame. Eh? They had. I uh, know. I'm. 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 I'm the, the kind of you know. Le, 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 uh, le, let's let's be let's be clear about this. What they did is they gave a they they offered a kind of canvas and said, "What do you want?" And it takes takes us right back to the to the question that we as a, both as a country, Kenya, and maybe as a continent, we haven't answered. What do we want for ourselves, really? In the absence of an answer to that particular question or a reflection on what, how we imagine ourselves, it means that every alien, every even the Venusians if, and the Martians, if they landed in the country and said, "We, you, you need a, I don't know what, a, a capsule to go, and it, it'll, and you will get ten percent of the shares of this," we will, we will subscribe to it only because. I don't understand why we haven't done the work, or we refuse to do the work, or we're not interested in doing the work of asking what do we want for ourselves and how do we see ourselves in the world as long as a people um, cannot position or imagine themselves standing at the top of mountains of the world and looking down um, you become vulnerable and stupid to everything else um, I'll take the problem you'd ask about if a, if a moral leader would arise hopefully he or she would be able to um, uh, uh, utilize our resources to pay back uh, the, the thing we did not need we did not need that SGR investment at all we had a railway that could have been improved. Mm. I suppose we have a question at the back. Yes, behind the camera is, yes. Yvonne, thank you for reflecting ourselves to us our own complicitness in this dehumanization that you've painted of the whole continent. I think you did that with deep sense of compassion, deep insight, with a cry for social justice. Um, you also, I don't think that there are any questions here. I think you've, you've pointed the way forward for us as well in this regard. And, and so we shouldn't be asking too many questions. We should be reflecting on what you're asking us to do to move forward. Earlier this week, too, we were confronted with a question um, where I think it was in the presentation by Thabo Mbeki, where we were asked to begin to remobilize ourselves on this continent for another liberation to take place. We also see, for those of us who work in women's organizations, that women's organizations are asking the very same thing. How do we begin to remobilize ourselves here? How, what, how do we begin this process, I guess? Who begins it? Where? Annalena, earlier in the week, also reminded us that this is not the responsibility of leaders. It is our responsibility to do that. If two decades ago we expected workers to take the lead, who are the social forces then in this current conjuncture that are going to take this forward? I think it's going to be a collective. I think it's going to come from the creative arts, from the youth, from, from the women. Um, if we're going to have this rehumanization taking place on this continent, then it's from those forces that I think that this reimagination and reconfiguration of the values, of the principles, the processes, and institutions to form, formulate what you're asking us for, a new social contract for this continent we call Africa, to, to define that, that good life. Uh, we need to define that for ourselves because you're asking us to, to pause, to push the pause bus, to push the pause button, and to have a kind of a disruption for a different future. And I guess I'm saying to Cadestria that um, your challenge is to reconvene us, 
so that we can have that discussion again and to, to try and begin to answer the question that you started us with, what it means to be human, what it means to be African this day, which is the same kinds of questions that the Pan-Africanist movement asked. We now again at that particular point and for Cadestria then to reconvene us to begin to answer those kinds of questions. Thank you. Thank you for the comment. This hand here has been up for a while, yes. Yes, thank you very much, Yvonne, for this uh, presentation. And I will take the cue from the lady that, in fact, I'm just wondering whether it is really necessary to ask you questions because you ask all the questions and you attempt answers. But what, if I'm standing, it is just to thank you for telling us, for reminding us that actually the problem is one. How do we get Africa out of this mess? I'm sorry for the term. And all of us need to get to the task. Whether you are from the literary studies, whether you are from uh, a sociologist, whether you are a linguist, a philosopher, we need to get together, we need to work together to think about how to get this continent out of this mess. So it is a, a lesson of of engagement into a kind of uh, inter, interdisciplinarity uh, actions. So we need to put our hands together, we need to put our heads together to think like one person in Africa. Thank you very much. Yes. We have about five minutes to go, so maybe two, three questions. Thank you very much for your enlightening presentation. Uh, I just want uh, to, it's like a kind of witnessing and a question. I went to Kenya as part of a uh, team of experts for experience in peace policy from Ethiopia. I'm from Ethiopia. And when we went to Kenya, what we found is not peace experts, but security officers. And when we were discussing about how to build peace in, in the Horn of Africa, uh, what they t told us is that 65% of the armed for the security and law enforcement budget was sponsored by uh, DFID and USAID. So this time we realized that first it's not about peace, it's about security. Second, it also speaks to what you have said about the parasite. And through the funding was sent the blood of the alien, and then from that moment on, there is, no, there is nothing to talk about anything. And another story is how the Chinese are playing in Ethiopia. The Chinese have been building roads, skyrappers, those all fancy things in Ethiopia, but our government and government officials were collaborating them to take hard currencies illegally through Djibouti and Somalia. So I found this a self-inflicted agony and we blame the West, Chinese, everything, everything. But at the end of the day, this all experience that I see reminds me uh, the last sentence of Animal Farm, Eric Blair's Animal Farm, wherein the, the, the sheep looks at where the, the pig and the humans are discussing, and it says, we couldn't distinguish which is which. So I just want, I just want you to say something. How do we liberate ourselves from this self-inflicted agony? Thank you very much. I, I wish I knew, but I am committed, like you, to um, uh, imagining uh, a way out. Um, and, and maybe the first step would be uh, those of us who feel this way uh, to find a way to meet again. Uh, because we cry and mourn over the same things, and maybe in, in both in the grief, uh, the power of grief is also that it brings light, and perhaps we can imagine a way out of this. Um, I wish I knew we recognize it, and because the, and, the, and the other part of the tragedy is that when we look at those who are the indistinguishable, you know, pig um, and humanists, uh, these are our people. These are our uncles. These are our aunties. We know them. Yeah. 
But thank you again for that insight. Uh, Pulen. Uh, good morning. Thank you very much, Yvonne, for your presentation. I smiled, I laughed, I cried, and I really appreciated it. I, I, I'd like to, to, to really affirm and, and, and receive with lots of love and grace your question that you say, have we apologized to the ancestors that have agitated and fought for the liberation of our continent and its people? But I also thought this was well woven to what Fatima was reminding us that we cannot only use the sources of analytics of the current discourses without understanding the worlds of knowledge, of resistance, of the affirmations of dignity and the quest for meaning that pre-colonial Africa had, which could be sources of hope and development for the future. So I really want to thank you for that. But I'm wondering, I, I heard we will come for the Chinese. Mm -hmm. What does that expression mean? Because for me, it means you are noting a contradictory experience or ontologies of being or our encounter with China that we are silent about or that we are yet to define because we're still making sense. And I'm curious, what does that mean? Thank you. Right, uh, thank you for your, uh, your very generous and kind comments. Uh, oh, about that, it was simply uh, an acknowledgement of the moment in which we find ourselves. Uh, the power of transition zones, you know, uh, you know, like places where the, the, the ocean meets the sand. It, these are places of power and opportunity. And I'm, I'm, I worry that uh, uh, the, you know, the, you know that expression, trying to put uh, a new wine into old skins. Uh, we have an opportunity for, uh, there's something new happening but I'm wondering if there's a way in which, um, as part of our own strategic visioning, we can find a way to language it for ourselves and step away from the rhetoric and the narrative and the imaging that others have imposed upon us. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, uh, Elder here. And then after this, there is a hand at the back. That will be the last one. Merci beaucoup. Je voudrais vraiment vous vous remercier pour avoir remis à nous tout ce qui peut rester d'orgueil pour l'Afrique et notre génération des années 60 avec l'espoir et au soir de notre vie et nous avons malheureusement la tristesse de voir que nos enfants et nos petits-enfants ont perdu l'espoir pour l'Afrique et votre discours euh, nous remet sur pied et nous redonne espoir et c'est ce qui m'amène à vous féliciter parce que Dans cette situation actuelle, euh, j'avoue ne pas avoir de mots pour caractériser l'impasse dans laquelle l'Afrique est aujourd'hui. Mais il y a l'espoir. Continuer à donner espoir à ceux qui se noient aujourd'hui dans la Méditerranée pour qu'ils restent dans ce continent. Et l'avenir est dans ce continent. Merci. Yes, the last one, yes. Right at the back. Oh. Good morning, and my name is Mantien Pasele, and I'm from uh, South Africa. And I would just 
like to say to our speaker this morning, thank you so much for speaking from your heart to our heart. Thank you for reminding us that whether or not we want to believe it, whether or not we want to see it, our humanity has been made indispensable, but our resources remain indispensable. And I don't know, as a people, can we continue with that kind of a situation? For how long are we going to sit down in the comfort of our living rooms and watch on TV when not just the bodies but the souls of our people are just pure meat for sharks and thereafter thrown off? We need to continue with this narrative but not just for the sake of writing papers and presenting at conferences, but as a way of saying, what do we do? Our spirits, the spirits of our ancestors continue to linger, not only in Africa, not only in the shores, but all over the world. And perhaps with Kodesria, we will find a home where those spirits will be called back. Yes, the dawn is coming, but the night is too long. But even in the long, long, long night, we need to continue working. You said to us we need to forget how to fear. And the reality of our continent is that there is fear in the country, in, sorry, in the continent. But perhaps for us to redeem this continent, not only for ourselves, but for the future generations, is for us to, you know, learn to forget how to fear. Because this is where our salvation as a continent lies. Thank you. We must bring this, unfortunately, to not an end. It's not an end note, uh, but a point where each of us will carry the, some of these heavy words with us. But I like especially that you warned us before you started. <laughs> but we didn't know how heavy it was going to be. But I also like the fact that at the end, you pointed us in a direction of hope. That's very important. So let me pass on to you words that the late Kofi Awuno left with us in a poem that he addressed to his old comrade, Ezekiel Mfaklele. He said, above all, tell them, tell the youth of hope and the promise of hope. We have saddled them with too much, what, of a burden. And that's why many of them would rather take their chances with the sharks than with their society. So if there is anything they need above all, it is hope. And when hope fails, tell them of the promise of hope. You've spoken as a storyteller, and you told us that there is power in the stories we tell ourselves, even in those that we choose not to tell ourselves. Beyond the stories, there must be just one thing. the chance to keep digging into what gives us the stories, the imagination. You said Africa's greatest problem now is not a crisis of glo globalization, but a crisis of what? 
imagination. I would say lack of imagination. But you've heard the responses. They are not so much of a que questions. They simply affirm what we are saying, what we have said. I would like to believe that the suggestion that has come from you and from a couple of those who have commented is perhaps a new agenda is being laid before Kodeshria. Have we not asked too many questions beyond the statistics, beyond the conclusions and the statistics placed before us? Can there not be some way beyond the darkness into the future? And it's true you've led before us a heavy burden, it's like a continent that is waiting for its burial. Recently, we lost one of our colleague poets, Atuko Okai. Let no one carve our tombstones now, for we shall refuse to die. I thank all of you. I'm no poet. <laughs> I think I've only read, written one poem in my life, so I won't add anything to that, just to thank uh, Yvonne Awar for the presentation, for honoring us with uh, your presence, and to thank uh, Professor Kofi Anidoho for chairing the session, and at that point request Prof to kindly present to Yvonne Awar this uh, uh, brand that we want to locate in her house, her office. It's a way of us telling the world that we know you. Thank you very much again. come to the end of this panel and uh, we'll take a break. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Mshai Mwangola for the introduction. Uh, we will take a 25-minute break and then resume uh, for the next panel. And I want to thank you very much for sustaining the momentum. Thank you. <laughs>